Okay, let's go ahead and um, go over the quiz first. What's the advantage of respiratory inductive plissismography over magnetometers and estimating lung volume? Any takers? Hit that button. The, um, the plissismography gives a circumferential measurement and the magnetometers only measure anterior and posterior. Yep. The, the, the best answer is that the rip vest gives a circumferential measure and magnetometers are only anterior posterior. Um, it's also okay if you said it, there's a clinical advantage to the rip vest because you can put it over the clothes as opposed to having it directly in contact with the skin. Okay? Uh, what's the ballpark amount of air that we breathe in for typical conversational speech? I hear murmurs that are correct. Someone murmur out loud. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, around 20% of our vital capacity. Uh huh. 20% of vital capacity or twice tidal volume. Okay. The reason you can't give me an exact value in cc's for that is because, remember, everything's proportional to our vital capacity. So 500 cc's might be right for some people, but not for others. Yeah. In my notes, I have twice tidal inspiration. Would that be the same thing? Close enough. Okay. You bet. Other questions? I think I just put 20%. I didn't specify. <laughs> that won't do. <laughs> you always have to get like the whole thing. Yeah. You're on the right track, but. Yeah. You know, I can't know you know unless you write it down. <laughs> I hate that about quizzes. Um, why do we tend to converse in the mid range of lung volumes? Yeah. Yep, principle of least effort. It requires less uh, active muscle forces to counteract the passive relaxation forces. We always want breathe, uh, breathing for speech to be efficient and speech to be easy. If a person sustains uh, five centimeters of water pressure for five seconds, what does it tell you about their respiratory abilities related to voice production? Yeah. That they have the ability to produce enough air for normal speech and that you can rule out a respiratory issue is, is a problem. Mm -hmm. You can rule out a respiratory issue. They've got the ability to generate enough subglottal pressure uh, for speech production. Okay? What characteristics of a newborn's rib cage and lungs contribute to the difficulty a newbie has in staying above REL? What are their rib cage and lungs like? The rib cage is flexible and compliant, and the lung recoil is nearly as strong as an adult's. Perfect. That's exactly it. Do you want to teach now? <laughs> Any questions on that one? Okay. Uh, what is the main contributor to reduced airway resistance as the, as the infant develops? Remember, reduced airway resistance is a good thing. Is it their, the radius of their airway increases? Yep. Radius of the airways increases. Anything about the airways getting bigger, particularly in diameter, uh, will make it easier. Okay? Um, in s this is a little bit harder to describe. In studies of aging, why is physiological age more relevant than chronological age? Who wants to take a stab at that one? Go ahead. Um, the physiological age has to do with the body shape, physical body shape and overall health and well, chronological is just the age and number of years. Mm -hmm. So if you go with um, body condition rather than body shape, that would be good. So it relates more to your physical conditioning and overall health. Okay, so it's more representative of how you function. Chronological age is kind of a who cares. So in studies, well, we all try to think so. So in studies of aging, you want people to be matched on physiological age rather than chronological age. Hickson and Weismer found evidence of expiratory muscle activity during inspiration. Uh, how did they explain that relative to speech breathing? Why do we do that? Yeah. That the um, abdominal wall is used as a platform to generate alveolar pressure. Mm -hmm. It's used as a platform for the diaphragm to contract against, platform to develop greater alveolar pressure, allows the diaphragm to contract more quickly and forcefully, anything like that allows you not to pooch out your stomach when you're breathing in. Questions on any of that? You guys getting the hang of the quizzes? <laughs> no, some of you are still looking shell-shocked. <laughs> um, remember, if you're struggling, you gotta come talk to me. 
Okay, seriously, don't, do not struggle in silence. If you're not getting it, usually there's some reason we can figure out why you're not getting it. Either you're missing it when you take the notes, or you're studying the wrong things, or you're focusing on the little stuff and it's the big stuff that matters. So, you know, d again, do not suffer in silence. There's nothing worse than failing quietly. Fail really, really loudly. <laughs> no, don't do that. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Um, we're going to do um, really just a brief section on physical acoustics, and it's really just to lead us into um, the acoustics of the laryngeal system and how we produce voice. So everything we're talking about today is trying to get to um, the sound source for voicing, but we need just a little bit of background um, to get to that. And we're going to start off with some things that are totally irrelevant, but I really like acoustic trivia. Um, and Haunted by Bad Vibes is uh, one of the acoustic trivia things. Go ahead and switch to this slide. There it is. Um, there is a phenomena called infrasound, I-N-F-R-A, infrasound. And infrasound is extremely low frequency sound. And infrasound can be produced by uh, drafts, breezes, kind of drafty, creepy places, uh, like old castles and old churches. And people, when they're in these places, report that feeling of creepiness and like, I'm sure there's ghosts around here and, you know, just strange, strange phenomena. And it's attributed to infrasound. Um, there was one uh, controlled study that was done where classical music was played to people and infrasound was added to the classical music. And the people who heard it reported feelings of chills down their spine and feelings of increased anxiety, just feelings of general creepiness about the, the whole thing. So infrasound is not necessarily a good thing for humans. Um, it's also associated with a couple of um, specific seasonal winds that occur in Europe. One of them occurs uh, in the Mediterranean area. It's called the Mistral. Don't worry about the details of this. Obviously, this is trivia, right? Um, and the Mistral um, makes people suffer from what they call seasonal nervous exhaustion. But there's a worse one, and it's, it's really comparable. It's called the Föhn. It sounds like a Peter Sellers thing, right? Pick up the Föhn. It's a, it's a Föhn in uh, Switzerland. And it's a wind that occurs in the Alps. And, you know, I've got lots of relatives in Switzerland, and one of them is a little bit of a hypochondriac, but he hates it when the foon comes around. And there's some documented evidence that shows things like suicides increase with these creepy seasonal winds. Everybody's more irritable, everybody's more anxious, and it's all because of the infrasound or the low frequency energies that's associated with the winds. So infrasound for people isn't a good thing. The only cool thing about infrasound that is good is it's how elephants communicate. Yeah, isn't that weird? I mean, not the big trumpeting thing that we hear, but, but elephants can communicate over like really, really long distances using infrasound that they generate that's around 10 hertz, which is really, really low frequency. So we, the, the low end of our hearing is around 20 hertz. We can't hear the elephants. They're around 10 hertz. And the low, low frequency uh, sound that they generate, because it's so low frequency, it has a really, really long wavelength, and so it travels really far. So elephants can communicate to each other over vast distances in the savanna, um, which is the good thing about infrasound. <laughs> the other acoustic phenomenon that's one of my favorite things is um, sonic booms which has absolutely nothing to do with infrasound. But this guy has the best website. Assuming we can get to it. Come. Let me see if it pulled it up. All right, magic stopped. I will try one more time. <coughs> Maybe it's here. Ah, yes. Okay. Get it so I can scroll to it. And it's just the coolest picture. Moving sound sources and sonic booms. 
And sonic booms are what happens when a plane breaks the sound barrier. A plane, it has to be a jet. And that's a picture of a jet breaking the sound barrier. And when the jet does that, it produces um, a huge acoustic shock wave that's a, sound, a sonic boom. So as the jet approaches the speed of sound, there's really, really high pressure front in front of it, right at the cone of the jet. And when it breaks through that high pressure front and exceeds the speed of sound, that's when you hear the sonic boom. Um, there is an MPG of this, but I, I haven't been able to get sound on it. Maybe we've got sound on it today. I kind of doubt it. Um, but you guys ought to go listen to it because it's this really low flyby of um, an F-15, I think, breaking the sound barrier. Don't update it now. Are you going to fix my sound? That's okay. That's what I figured. Um, go ahead and look that one up sometime, though. It's like if you look up Sonic Boom, it's the jet fighter that will always come up, and it's just a really cool flyby. When I was growing up in Pennsylvania, um, I lived near a military base, uh, and we lived right by the Blue Mountains or the Appalachian Mountains, and now and then the F-15s would just zip on by uh, running along the, the Blue Ridge Mountains, and all of a sudden you'd hear this sonic boom and the windows would rattle. It was so cool. <laughs> Never saw the cool pressure wave, though. All right, that's the cool acoustic stuff I know. Now we've got to go on to the mundane stuff. All right. So the mundane stuff is how we characterize waveforms. And we're trying to get to understanding the acoustic waveform that we produce with the voice. And most of you have had this, um, at least a quick run through of this in speech science. I'm not in speech science, in um, science of sound. And, um, but we'll just go over it for review so we're sort of all on the same page here. So the way to picture what we're talking about with waveforms now is to picture um, a classic sine wave. And let me just put one up here so you can see what we're talking about. Okay, can you flip to, um, there we go. So on the scope, what you see right now is a sine wave that's about 100 hertz. A sine wave is a pure tone, and you can see that there's a pattern of cycles repeating themselves. Okay, it's a really clear pattern there. Um, it repeats regularly over time. And the period of that waveform is the time it takes to complete one cycle. So one up, one down is the period of that waveform. And then the cycle repeats itself. So the pattern repeats itself. Okay? So period is a measure of time. It's usually measured in milliseconds. And when you think of um, measuring the period of a waveform, you think of it going along the, um, the horizontal axis. So time on a classic waveform that we see when we're looking at a microphone output or something, time is going along the horizontal axis. Frequency is a little bit different. Frequency is the number of cycles per second. So if we would imagine on this that um, the screen that you see is worth one second. Oh, that's not what I wanted. And I fit 100 cycles in there. The frequency would be 100 cycles per second. Okay, so it's just how many times the waveform repeats itself in one second. Frequency is virtually always measured um, in seconds. And as you may recall, hertz, that measurement of frequency, means cycles per second. It's the unit that we measure frequency in. Okay, so hertz is cycles per second. It's the unit we measure frequency, and frequency is just the number of cycles that repeat in one second. Questions so far? Now there is an inverse relationship. Remember, period is the time it takes to complete one cycle. Uh, there's an inverse relationship between frequency and period. 
and I just wanted to show you this on a frequency and period calculator because in the old days you had to figure out the frequency of something by actually measuring on a, a paper output how far it was in like millimeters. It was really, really ugly. Um, now things have gotten a whole lot easier. And what I like this for is it gives a really good example of how the period changes uh, with the frequency. So if I put in is NumLock somewhere? Oh, good. <laughs> I thought my computer was being weird. Okay, so if I put in... I'm sorry, I don't want that. I want Hertz. If I put in a frequency of 50 Hertz, we know that is a relatively low frequency, and it's going to take a relatively long amount of time for that pattern to repeat itself. Okay, so a low frequency sound is going to have a long period. If I make it 500 hertz, you can see we're down to a two millisecond period. So that has, um, as the frequency increases, the period decreases. At 5,000 hertz, now I'm to 0.2 milliseconds. Okay, don't worry about the exact numbers. What I'm trying to show you is the inverse relationship here. So as frequency increases, it means the pattern's repeating more quickly over time. As frequency increases, uh, the period decreases. Okay, so the time it takes to complete one cycle decreases. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. Okay, amplitude refers to uh, the displacement, how strong the vibration actually is. So amplitude, you look at uh, on a waveform on the vertical axis, and that's the third dimension that we usually describe uh, when we're talking about a waveform. So let me show you how these vary uh, using the scope. So right now we have a, um, a sine wave on the scope. Go ahead and switch to the scope again. There you go. A sine wave on the scope that's around 70 hertz. So what we should hear is a relatively low frequency sound. Oh, good. Right on cue. Low frequency sound. Let me make it a little bit louder so you can hear it. And notice the spacing between the, um, each cycle of the sine wave. So what should happen to that spacing or the period when I increase the frequency? It should get smaller. The, the, the waveform should start looking squished together. Okay, so listen to it as I change it. So now I'm at around 340 hertz, 340 cycles per second. You can see that the period got shorter as the frequency increased, and we can hear it as well. So what is the perceptual correlate? I did that for my son this morning. Now he wants to take it home to play with it. Um, and of course I said yes. Um, so what's the perceptual correlate of frequency? When I change frequency, what do you hear a change in? Pitch, okay. So that's one of the reasons you have to be really careful with those terms. Pitch is what you perceive, and frequency is what you actually measure in hertz. Okay, so that's the frequency difference, and now I want to show you what a difference in amplitude sounds like. So let's go to something that's around 100 hertz. And again, this is a sine wave. And now I want to increase the amplitude. So this is the thing that I'm feeding into the oscilloscope is a function generator. So I can tell it to just generate a sine wave at a certain frequency, and you're seeing the visual display of that. So I'm going to make this louder. And you can see the corresponding difference in the amplitude. So what, we, what do we perceive as increased amplitude? Loudness, OK? So again, you've got to be careful with those terms. The perceptual correlate of amplitude is loudness. 
Remember, now that we've gone through all the lung stuff, you don't want to call it volume anymore because that means how much air is in a given place. Okay? All right, any questions on that? Yeah? Can you still use intensity as a synonym? No. Um, because intensity is different from sound pressure level. Uh, amplitude, when you're looking at a waveform, is just the safest. And then it should be defined somewhere on the waveform, somewhere on the graph, what amplitude is being measured in. Okay, so you have to calibrate amplitude to be equal to something in intensity, and you have to calibrate it to be equal to sound pressure level. So I have to generate a known sound pressure level to say that was 70 dB SPL. Otherwise, it's just relative amplitude. Okay? So that was a sine wave. Um, we might look a little bit later at a couple of different kinds of waveforms. The sine wave is the easiest because that's a pure tone and you only have um, a single frequency that you're working with. Now the only time that we consider phase is when we have more than a pure tone. So phase means that um, it's the temporal relation of more than one sine wave. So a sine wave is a pure tone. As soon as you have more than one sine wave, you've got a complex tone. Now when you start putting sine waves together, usually they're of different frequencies and they may or may not line up with each other. So when we think of something being in phase or out of phase, we're looking at these high pressure peaks here. See these peaks where there's maximum pressure or minimum pressure? If those peaks are lined up in a complex wave, we say that those waveforms are in phase with each other. Okay, so being in phase means that those pressure peaks are lined up perfectly. If those pressure peaks, oh, let me go back to here for a second. So you see here that these two waveforms have a lined up pressure peak, and there's an additive effect that gives you a more powerful output. When you add together two sine waves that are lined up and in phase with each other, you end up with a louder sound when they're perfectly in phase with each other. Things are a little bit funky when they're kind of out of phase, so just, I just want you to understand the extremes of this. When you add up two waveforms that are perfectly in phase, you've strengthened the sound. And then if you add up two waveforms that are absolutely perfectly out of phase with each other, what do you think you end up with? Yes, flat line. <laughs> flat line, not a good thing. You end up with silence. Okay, they, they basically cancel each other out. Now things that are perfectly in phase and perfectly out of phase hardly ever happen in, you know, certainly not in our voice. You usually end up with something in the middle somewhere. Okay, but just understand the extremes of completely in phase, you've strengthened the sound completely out of phase, you've made it silent. The other concept that I want you to keep in mind is complex waves are always made up of a bunch of sine waves. Okay, as soon as you've got two or more sine waves, you have a complex wave. Most everything that we hear and most everything that we produce, virtually all that we produce with our voice, is a complex wave. Sine waves are the, the rarity. So one of the concepts for this is constructive and destructive interference. And, and don't feel like you have to memorize this. I just, again, kind of want you to get the idea. Constructive interference, and it sounds wrong, doesn't it? Sounds like an oxymoron. Military intelligence, constructive interference. No interference really should be constructive. Um, here they call something constructive when the waveforms are adding together. Destructive is an example like here where the waveforms are canceling each other out. 
So constructive means the, the, you're adding sound power. Destructive means that you're losing power. You can have varying degrees of in and out of phase. And all of these sine waves will add together to produce a complex squiggly waveform. Depending upon how much, yeah, that was the technical term, depending how much the pressure peaks lined up perfectly, canceled each other out, or did something part way in between. Okay, that's how we end up with complex waveforms not looking anything like sine waves anymore. So you can have um, these tones adding together. Uh, here you have a 100 hertz, a 300 hertz, and a 500 hertz. And then the, the waveform that you actually get looks something like the squiggly one down here. This again is just adding waveforms together. And you end up with the resulting waveform on the bottom. So you're adding a bunch of sine waves that have that perfectly repeating pattern. But because the pattern's repeating at different frequencies, you get different versions of adding those pressure peaks together and canceling them out. Okay, and that's how you end up with one that looks like this. That kind of making sense? Okay. Yeah. Going back to the constructive and destructive Power meaning strength of the signal that you hear. And I'm sure power has a, an extremely precise definition in physics that I just killed. Um, but just think of it as how strong the sound is. Other questions? OK, so here you see these two tones have the same frequency. They're both 200 hertz. So each of them is a repeating pattern that repeats 200 times a second. The one on top, you'd recognize as a sine wave. And this one, down at the bottom, you would recognize as a complex wave because clearly some other frequencies were added into it. And it gets tricky when you start thinking about the other frequencies being added into it. It's still a 200 hertz tone because that was the lowest frequency that was present. Okay, that's the lowest repeating pattern. So even though there might be 200 hertz, 400 hertz, 600, 800, it's still a 200 hertz tone with all those extra squiggles of constructive and destructive interference because the lowest repeating frequency was at 200 hertz. And 200 hertz is the pitch that we would perceive. We wouldn't hear 200, 400, 600, 800. You'd hear a kind of complex, sort of rich sounding tone, but we'd hear the pitch is around 200 hertz. Yeah? Why is that that the lowest frequency kind of takes the cake? <clears throat> you know what I mean? Some law of physics. <laughs> All the other frequencies are added on top of it. Um, I, I, it's just what we perceive is a fundamental frequency, and the other frequencies are what give the tone um, sort of its richness. But I don't have a better answer than that. Maybe an auditory person would know. Yeah? So are you saying that 200 In this example, yeah. And we'll look at other examples where that could change. So the fundamental frequency can be virtually any frequency, as long as within that complex tone, where you've got a bunch of sine waves put together, it was the lowest one. So I could have a fundamental frequency, and, and singers would do this, of like 1,000 hertz. And so they would be producing a complex tone that had 1,000 hertz. Uh, What's 1,000 times 3? You'd think I'd get that. 3,000 hertz, 5,000 hertz, odd number multiples. But what we would perceive would be a really high pitch. And if we measured it, it would be 1,000 hertz. So we're not going to hear all of the different 
uh, all of the different frequencies that are present in a complex tone. We hear it like a chord that you can pick, okay, that was middle C, okay? So our ear takes it from a chord to give us one pitch to perceive. Does that work? Kind of, unless you break up the chord and then it all changes. Other questions? Yeah. Um, but even when you break up the chord, and I'm thinking about like playing the piano, it's still a complex wave. There's still more. Than yeah, a piano there. doesn't produce a pure tone. No instrument except like a synthesizer would produce a pure tone. Yeah. You had a question. What's What's the difference between a wave and a tone? Um, I'm using tone to refer to as what we would hear, and a waveform would be like a visual display of it. And a waveform is also what travels through the air. Yeah. So the um, the complex wave is just more depth, has more depth to it. Would that be? We hear it as richness. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Other questions? Okay. All right, so there's this, a technique acoustically that we use to break down a complex tone into its component sine waves. And it's called Fourier analysis. And Fourier analysis is um, a mathematical method that we have software and computers that do it now that takes a complex tone and tells you what the component sine waves are. Now we're going to talk about a number of different ways to uh, represent waveforms. And when we look at one like this, we're looking at an acoustic spectrum. Now all, there's about three different ways that we're going to look at waveforms and they can be kind of confusing. The only way to keep them straight is to get the axes straight. Okay, you have to know what the vertical axis means and what the horizontal axis represents. So in a spectrum, you have um, frequency in hertz going along uh, the horizontal axis. So that's going to tell you the frequency of the sine waves that are present in that complex tone. Okay, so this is a complex tone. We see the lowest frequency or the fundamental frequency is 100 hertz. It also has um, acoustic energy at 150 and at 200 hertz. Almost always, as you go up in frequency, you go down in amplitude or strength of the tone. So the fundamental frequency almost always is the strongest, most predominant uh, sine wave that's present in a complex wave. So here you see that you lose strength of each of these components as they go up in frequency. And that's just classic. It's really, really unusual to have um, a spectrum that doesn't go down in amplitude. It slopes downward um, as it goes. So this is a site that has some breakdowns of um, complex waves. And it's under Fourier analysis. Fourier decomposition, building a wave uh, shape from signs. Uh, OK, so this goes a little bit quickly. If you look at this form on the left here, you can see first a sine wave with a single fundamental frequency. What don't you like? There's not audio in this. Oh, okay. Don't worry about it. Thanks, though. Um, there you see on the, that made me echo. You're going to take the echo away? <laughs> um, you can see here that this, oh, that's better. You can see here that this started out as a sine wave. Frequencies are added to it, um, and it turns into a complex wave. So what this is illustrating is the Fourier analysis, or the breakdown of all the frequencies that are present in this complex waveform. 
Okay, so whenever you have a complex waveform, you know it's just a bunch of sine waves put together. And the Fourier analysis is what will allow you to break them down and know what the component parts are. Is that working? Okay. All right. So there are some patterns um, to complex tones. And sometimes the terminology gets a little bit confusing because we tend to use different terminology than singers do. Um, we, as speech pathologists, call the first harmonic the fundamental frequency. Singers will probably call it the first harmonic. You just count upward from the other frequencies that are present. So then you have the second, third, fourth harmonic. Singers will call anything above the fundamental frequency an overtone because it's over the fundamental frequency. Okay? We're fine with harmonics. We'll always talk about it in harmonics. But just know when you hear singers talk about it, they'll talk about um, the harmonic and then overtones. So one of the, go ahead, I'm sorry. Somebody have a question? Random movement. Um, so one of the things to keep in mind is, again, the lowest repeating pattern or the lowest frequency sine wave is going to be the fundamental frequency. So it's the lowest tone in a harmonic series. If you're looking at a complex waveform, and remember seeing all those squiggles, if it's periodic, those squiggles will repeat in a regular pattern. Okay, you can all, if it's not noise, you can find a pattern to the complex waveform squiggles. Okay, and that pattern is the lowest repeating pattern, and that's going to be the fundamental frequency. So almost always visually, you can figure out where the fundamental frequency is. Now, when we get to the human voice, we know that the human voice is fairly rich. Um, it doesn't sound shallow or tinny or like a pure tone in most people. And that's because it, we produce a complex tone with the voice. Different types of complex tones have characteristic, uh, characteristic composition or characteristic spectra. And ours is a little bit weird to think about, but it's easy once you get to it. It's whole number multiples of the fundamental frequency. And all of you are going, I was promised there would be no math. <laughs> but it's okay. Because all you do is take the fundamental frequency, multiply it by one, that's the fundamental. Multiply it by two, three, four, five, on up. Okay, so the easiest, the easiest pattern then is a typical male voice with a fundamental frequency of 100 hertz. Okay, so you've got, I don't know if I wrote that one. Um, I didn't do it for 100. So for a male voice, you'd have uh, the spectrum or that Fourier composition that we would do of a male voice at 100 hertz fundamental frequency. You would see uh, a spike at 100 hertz, then 200, 300, 400, 500, 600, 700, on up. The multiples get a little bit trickier when we look at what would be a female voice at around 200 hertz. So 200 times 2, 200 times 3, 200 times 4, 200 times 5. So these would be the frequencies that are present when you do a Fourier analysis of a female voice at 200 hertz. Okay, so it's the fundamental and whole number multiples of the fundamental frequency. And that's characteristic of the, of the acoustic waveform that we produce with our vocal folds. So the 300 hertz could be an example of a kid's voice. Little kid's voice around 300 hertz fundamental frequency. And what you can see is that things get spread out quite a bit. So now we've got 300, 600, 900, 1200, 1500, and there's going to be less acoustic energy where we hear it really well. 
So this relates to just the power of voices or how strong voices are perceived to be. So why do you think it is that a lot of female broadcasters make their voices sound like this when they broadcast? What's the acoustic advantage of doing that? Yeah? Your voice just sounds more powerful, more kind of commanding almost. Why does it sound more powerful and commanding? What's happening acoustically? Somebody hit the mic and tell me. I didn't hear who said that. Go ahead. Did they lower their frequency? They lower their fundamental frequency. And if you lower your fundamental frequency, what's that doing to all the harmonics? Go ahead. Lowering the harmonics? It lowers the harmonics and you end up with a denser spectrum. So you end up with more energy, say from uh, 200 hertz to 2000 hertz. I've got a lot more harmonics present if I lower my pitch down like this. So male voices automatically have greater acoustic power because they have a denser spectrum. There are more frequencies that we hear in a lower pitched voice. Is that making sense? So now you've got a picture of the whole spectrum. I don't know if I have a good picture of that. So here you look, if you just look at this example, here's a complex tone. Uh, you would have 100, 200, 300, 400. The more spread out this is, the less power there is to the voice, the less carrying power there is. The more dense that spectrum is, with a lower fundamental frequency, the more powerful the voice sounds, because the, the acoustic spectrum is denser. OK, so the way we illustrate this, the way we try to get a sense of the harmonics and the power that's present in a voice is by doing a spectral analysis. And that's what we've started to look at already. So on the horizontal axis, you have frequency. And on the vertical axis, you have amplitude. So here you see the F for frequency. Here you see the A for amplitude. So this is a spectrum of this sine wave. Okay, the sine wave here is illustrated just like any old waveform that we look at when you use a microphone. Okay, time is going across the horizontal axis. Amplitude is still here. But when we do a Fourier analysis and break it down, you now have frequency going along the horizontal axis and amplitude here. So if it, just one sec, if it's a pure tone, you're only going to have a single frequency represented on the spectrum. Okay, one sine wave, one frequency on the spectrum. Go ahead, Conley. Um, going to the back to the harmonics. So is that why, like, if when you hear a singer on a radio or a CD, um, it you can kind of tell versus watching them live or listening to them live that their voices are deeper. Yeah. Is that? Um, or is it because of the um, instruments that are used in the studio to there, record? There are so or? many things that you can do now to a voice when it's digitized. You know, you, you can make all kinds of enhancements. You can make people who sing flat sound like they sing in tune. You, you can add all kinds of stuff to it. So certainly what you hear live is more representative of the person's true voice. Uh, because unless they're doing... Um, you know, there are some effects that you can add live as well. But if, if you just hear a person live with no amplification, that's really what their voice is. I don't trust digital and studio recordings because um, they make people sound perfect. When we get to um, the laryngeal system, we'll compare some live with studio recordings and you'll see what it does. I mean, they fix bad singers. Which is fine until you hear them live and go, damn, you're not very good. Um, so. Okay, so we've got um, the spectrum of a pure tone here with a single frequency. As soon as you add other sine waves, you've turned it into a complex tone, and now the spectrum has to have more than one frequency present. The Fourier analysis will break it down into its component sine waves. You okay with that? So there are different types of 
representations of spectra. Um, and here, really, what we're talking about is the difference between um, a sound that is periodic, which means that it repeats regularly over time, and a sound that is aperiodic, which means that it's really, really random. So this is an example of aperiodicity. What's a sound in English that's characterized by aperiodicity? What's the noisiest sound in the English language? <laughs> yes, that's incongruous, isn't it? Um, yeah, I always think of S because that's the most irritating one to me and it happens so often. Yeah, any of the, the, fric the fricatives are uh, basically just noise. Noise modulated at slightly different frequencies, but basically noise. So fricatives are aperiodic. We can kind of hear pitches with them, but not nearly like you can if I go, ah, 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 that you really, really know what the pitch is. With sh, s, f, you sort of hear it, but with noise and aperiodic, there is no regularly repeating waveform in there anywhere. Okay, so aperiodicity is purely random waveforms, um, and it's characterized, uh, we hear it as noise. So this one, even though it's a square wave, is regularly repeating, and it would be a periodic sound, and we can identify the spectral characteristics of it. So these are all the frequencies of the sine waves that are present in this square wave. This noise, you see we look at the spectrum here, we've got frequency going across this way, amplitude or intensity here, and you can see that it's just random. There's no pattern to it whatsoever. Okay, so noise is aperiodic, uh, no regularly repeating pattern. Okay, so the three ways that we tend to look at speech um, are with waveforms, spectral analysis, and a spectrogram. And these are the ones where I want you to be able to get the axes straight because they would completely change your interpretation of what you're seeing. Okay, so this is the waveform um, like the kind that you see when you look at the output of a microphone. Um, any recording kind of thing on your computer will give you a waveform that looks like this. So if you take a look at this one and you look at this part going right up to about 0.375, is that a periodic waveform or an aperiodic waveform? Periodic. periodic, yep. Even though it's a really complex waveform, you see all kinds of bumps, you see all kinds of different amplitudes, you can see a regularly repeating pattern. So we would base the fundamental frequency on how long it took to complete one cycle of this regularly repeating pattern. Okay, so even though it looks like a lot of squiggly lines, we see that they repeat. And that means we would not hear it as noise, we'd hear it as some kind of tone that we could associate with a given pitch, and we could assign it a fundamental frequency. So that's a classic speech waveform where you have time going across the horizontal axis, and amplitude and the vertical axis. Now here's back to an illustration of a spectrum of a pure tone. Remember here, this version has intensity here, I tend to call it amplitude, and frequency going along the vertical axis. We know that in a pure tone, highly atypical in anything in nature, we know that a pure tone um, only has a single frequency. So what can generate a pure tone? Where are we likely to hear a pure tone? A tuning fork? Tuning fork is the classic pure tone. Yeah, tuning fork generates a pure tone. Um, where else might we hear a pure tone or a sine wave? Hmm? Okay. Out of there. Yeah, <laughs> function generators can give them to you too. Um, I'm thinking of audiology things, audiometric testing. I'm pretty sure they use sine waves, don't they? You guys haven't had audiology yet, have you? 
<laughs> Trust me on this one. I'm pretty sure it's a sine wave. So the spectrum of any sine wave is going to be a single frequency at whatever um, the repeating pattern of the sine wave was. Now, speech spectra um, looks a little bit different because we know that when we produce voice, we, we are producing a fundamental frequency and lots of harmonics. Okay, we've got that fundamental frequency and the whole number multiples all present in our voice at any given time. So as I change my pitch, if I'm going ah, ah, the spectrum is going to look different. I'm going to have a denser spectrum and ah than I am at ah. Okay, because as soon as I go high, the multiples of the fundamental frequency spread out and it becomes less dense. So this looks more complicated. Here we've got uh, frequency going along here and this one is uh, actually calibrated in sound pressure level and we have the fundamental frequency and then each of these peaks is going to represent the whole number multiple of the fundamental frequency. Okay, so each peak that you see, let's say this is 100 hertz, this one's at 200, 300, 400, 500, all the way up. Now, it doesn't look like a classic slope like we saw with those other um, complex waves that we've looked at so far. What do you think it is that's making some of these frequencies have more energy than others? Since now we're talking about speech. Yeah. Subglottal pressure? Good guess, but no. Subglottal pressure is directly related to intensity. Um, this is actually representing the energy of each frequency at a given intensity. So this is like a slice of ah, uh, okay, a cross section of ah. Uh, and so the loudness that I'm producing here is going to influence how strong that fundamental frequency is. Um, but it's not going to have a lot of effect on the shape of that. So if I go, ah, ee, ooh, ah, ee, ah, yeah. Um, would you just be changing the phonemes that you'd be yeah, pronouncing? Yeah, exactly. So the thing that is making some of these, and we're going to get into this in more detail than you would ever want to later on, but the reason this isn't just a straight slope down is because of the actual vowel that's being produced here. And so different vowels are going to have different concentrations of energy and that's why in different frequencies. And that's why we hear them as the different vowels that we do. Yeah. So then in that, that's one vowel or is that what I... That's actually one vowel. It's like a slice of a split second of a vowel. And that's the weirdest thing to keep in mind because we change speech really, really dynamically. But when you're looking at a spectral analysis, most of the time it's just of a split second. So um, if I would do, and, and again, when we get to um, speech acoustics, we'll go into this more. If I do ah, uh, ooh, ee, 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 you would see the same distribution of where these peaks are, but you would see the strength of those peaks change. Okay, so at one point the lower frequencies would be strong, at another point the middle frequencies would be strong, and all of it would vary with that same spectrum. All of it would vary depending what vowel I was saying. Kind of working? Let's keep going and see if it makes any more sense. Uh, nope. Okay, so the part that I want you to get now is the spectral analysis is basically a Fourier analysis, breaking down the complex tone into the component sine waves. And the part to just kind of put on the back burner for now is the strength of those component frequencies is going to change depending what sound we're producing. Yeah? So is it the, the resonance, what's affecting the strength, is that... Don't, it don't think about it yet. Okay. <laughs> it's actually the shape of the upper vocal tract because you're, you're shifting, you're, you're, you're modifying the vocal signal by whatever shape the upper vocal tract is in because that's all I'm doing if I'm doing oh, yeah, yeah. yeah right. 
Okay, so this is the last representation, and if you really get into speech acoustics, this is the one that you will see the most often. This is called a spectrogram, and it's a, a different acoustic analysis of speech, and it's the coolest one. This one has, like the um, regular old waveform, this one has time going across here. Oh, I had to figure, okay, who, who has enough phonetics to read what it says? Speech Perception Lab, you all pass phonetics, well done. <laughs> Took me a second. So this says Speech uh, Perception Lab. We've got time going across here, so that's why this is the S, this is the P, and there are a few people on the planet who can actually look at one of these and tell you what the person is saying, which I think is like way cool, um, or they just have too much time on their hands. <laughs> um, but each sound has an acoustic characteristic associated with it. Again, don't worry about the details. What I want you to understand this time are the different ways to display waveforms. Okay, so this is the last one. This is the speech spectrogram. You've got time going across here, frequencies here. So what dimension is missing? Amplitude is missing. And in a spectrogram, amplitude is based on how dark the trace is. So these bands represent strong frequencies. Down here, where this is kind of a blank, there was no energy there at all. So we can see that the energy associated with the S is relatively high frequency from 4,000 to 8,000 hertz. Okay, but below that for the S, we don't have anything. So just get the concept of that illustration versus um, the spectrum, because the spectrum is completely different. And um, a spectrum for an S would just look like noise, that really aperiodic dark black, where you couldn't pick out any frequency at all. This would be regularly, uh, this would be periodic. This is actually, again, don't worry about it, this is actually showing each cycle a vocal fold vibration. So this is a guy talking because those cycles are kind of spread out. So we know that that's probably around 100 hertz. Um, and that's the way that we most likely, um, there are a lot of measures that we can get from this. This is a really classic way to uh, analyze speech. Any questions on the three different types of displays of sound? The waveform, the spectrum, or spectra, and uh, spectrogram. Okay, a couple of other um, just basic concepts. One of the things that happens with a periodic sound, like somebody who has a really, really clear voice, um, is that there's a lot of energy in the harmonics compared to aperiodic energy. So if my vocal folds are vibrating, and again, we'll get a little bit more to this when we get to voicing, if my vocal folds are vibrating really, really periodically and take exactly the same amount of time to repeat themselves, I have a spectrum that has 200 hertz, 300 hertz, no, 200 hertz, 400 hertz, 600 hertz, 800 hertz, and nothing in between. Okay, so I've got a really good signal to noise ratio. You hear a lot of the harmonics and not much noise in my voice. So signal to noise ratio can be applied to other things. Like right now, there's a really good signal to noise ratio because I'm talking and you guys are really quiet. At the beginning of a class or in, a, in an elementary school, the teacher's signal to noise ratio is terrible. The kids are yammering, the teacher's trying to be heard over them, and that shifts the signal to noise to one that's really not as favorable for voice production. Okay, so signal to noise, you can think of it within a spectrum or you can think of it sort of environmentally, like this, the person speaking versus all the background noise. Oh, city birds sing soprano. So what they found in this study was that, what, what do you think birds in the city have to compete with when they're trying to attract a mate compared to birds in the country? What, what? Any takers? No bird watchers, huh? Go ahead. 
Noise pollution. Noise. There's so much noise. So these poor little birds have to be heard over all the background noise of traffic. And we heard one the oh last night. Have you guys ever heard um, an, an eastern screech owl? Oh, it is the coolest sound on the planet. It sounds like a horse whinnying. It's just bizarre. It's the most brilliant. And next to a loon, it's the coolest bird sound there is. And in the heights, there's, there's a, in the trees around us, there's a western screech, eastern screech owl. And he was calling last night. He was just going nuts. I mean, just constant, really, really loud. I mean, he would have been heard over anything. And then we heard another one respond. He found a mate over the noise. I was so happy for him. So what they found was that some city birds actually shift their frequencies compared to their country cousins so that they can be heard above all of the background noise. Um, so that's an example of the signal to noise ratio. Okay, the last concept that I wanted to address is the idea of a spectral envelope. So if you think back to this one, you can kind of see a shape to this spectrum. If you would draw a line over all of this, you would get what's called a spectral envelope. So the spectral envelope is giving you the general shape of the waveform. So here we've got um, a 300 hertz uh, waveform. And you can see here, this is the envelope. So it's relatively spread out because we've got, I don't know if this is whole number multiples or not, 300, 600, 900. Here's a 100 hertz waveform. You can see it's a more compressed spectral envelope. The thing that I'd like you to notice is even though these are two different frequencies, the person is producing the same sound. This is probably like an E. You can see that the shape of the spectral envelope is the same. So the spectral envelope, or the general shape of the spectrum, um, will tell you where the high energy is concentrated in the frequencies. And it will show you like differences between E and ah. So if I go E, ah, ooh, ah, my frequency is staying the same, but the spectral envelope would be shifting. So that's like looking at the pattern overlaid on this. If this person stayed at the same pitch, but changed the vowel they were producing, these peaks would be in a different place, and you'd have a different overall shape to that spectrum. Okay, So it's just sort of a, a global way to say where the energy is concentrated in the different frequencies in a spectrum. Ah, go back. OK, last thing I wanted to talk about is the spectrum of a glottal waveform. So this is the waveform that we generate at the level of the vocal folds. And when you think about the glottal waveform in its purest form, you have to think about, well, you don't have to, but I always think about a person with their head chopped off. Um, so you have no resonating vocal tract above it. OK, so this is what's produced if you only had the vocal folds vibrating and it went right out into the air. So you see here the strongest energy is associated with the fundamental frequency. You've got energy present at the whole number multiples of the fundamental. And you can see that it drops off fairly quickly. So whenever we're producing different sounds, we're superimposing it on this basic glottal envelope. OK, so this is the waveform that we produce with our voice. And then the spectral envelope is going to show us how we modify that as the sound travels through the upper vocal tract. OK? So take a look at this. I know it can be a little bit abstract. Take a look at it um, tomorrow and come with any questions on Thursday. The next section, I didn't break up into different sections. It's just one big section on the laryngeal system. OK? And that's what we'll start next time. Have a good afternoon, guys.